Good afternoon. I am Nancy Cohen. I am the manager of the Jewish Museum of Florida and uh, I just want to thank you for having inviting us to co-host this wonderful program today with Casa Cuba. Um, just uh, here to thank you and to um, to participate and to welcome all of our all of the people here on the on the on the discussion, Rebecca and Ruth. We're looking forward to hearing all about your beautiful book. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you very much, Nancy, and good afternoon uh, to you all. Um, I would like to thank you for joining us today for Conversando with Ruth Behar, the first of two events that Casa Cuba at FIU is organizing in partnership with the Jewish Museum of Florida. Before we begin, I would like to tell you about Casa Cuba, a new and very special project for the Cuban community and beyond. Casa Cuba is bringing together scholars, policymakers, business leaders, students, and the community at large to build a leading cultural center and think tank for the discussion and study of Cuban affairs and the celebration of the Cuban heritage. Casa Cuba has attracted influential board members, secured a prominent site on the FIU campus for its state-of-the-art facility, and received significant philanthropic support, including prestigious grants from the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Knight Foundation. Our venue will feature galleries for interactive exhibits, classrooms to teach FIU's more than 70 courses on Cuba, and a state-of-the-art venue for events, artistic performances, and dynamic programs such as Conversando. Once Casa Cuba is built, FIU will be the only university in the nation with two major institutions devoted to Cuban and Jewish heritage. It is therefore our greatest aspiration that we will become the hub for Cuban Jewish history and culture, and we need your help to make this dream a reality. Conversando is just a taste of what you will experience at Casa Cuba. This series is envisioned as conversations with prominent Cuban figures about their life experiences and how these experiences have influenced their work and craft. Today's event will explore Ruth Behar's book, Lucky Broken Girl, how this story began in Ruth's childhood and how it inspires us to reflect on the meanings of friendship, culture, and identity. Ruth Behar was born in Havana. She grew up in New York and has lived in Spain and Mexico. Her books, An Island Called Home and Traveling Heavy, explore her return journeys to Cuba and her search for home as an immigrant and a traveler. She was the first Latina to win a MacArthur Genius Grant, and her many other accolades included John Simon Guggenheim Fellowship, a Distinguished Alumna Award from Wesleyan University, and an Honorary Doctorate in Humane Letters from the Hebrew Union College. She was recently named a Great Immigrant by the Carnegie Corporation and she is an anthropology professor at the University of Michigan. Today, Ruth will be in conversation with my esteemed colleagues, Rebecca Friedman and Anna Menendez, who have graciously volunteered their time and talent for this discussion. Rebecca is a director of the Wolfsonian Public Humanities Lab at FIU and a faculty member of the Department of History. Anna Menendez is the director of the Humanities Edge program at FIU. She is also the author of four books of fiction, Adios, Happy Homeland, The Last War, Loving Che, and in Cuba, I Was a German Shepherd. We are privileged to be joined by Ruth, Rebecca, and Anna today. And now I will leave you with Ruth so that she can introduce her book, Lucky Broken Girl. Thank you. Okay, hello. <laughs> Well, I'm so glad to be here. Thank you so much to Casa Cuba and the Jewish Museum of Florida um, and FIU for inviting me. I'm so glad to be part of this conversation and thinking about Cuban Jewish identity. Um, I'm going to introduce my book, Lucky Broken Girl, just say a few words about it and um, hopefully uh, be able to show you some slides uh, that are going to come on the screen um, in a moment. Um, so this book, Lucky Broken Girl, is, uh, is based on my life story, but it is also a novel. So it took inspiration from my life and real things that happened to me and my family. Um, but also, um, given that, that it's fiction, I had permission 
to to change things and to to make things a little bit more magical sometimes as well, um, different from the way they were in reality. So let me start. I'm going to show you a couple of slides from um, when I was a little girl in Cuba. Um, so Maite, if you can move uh, forward to the next slide. Um, here's a very iconic picture of me on the malecon um, with my beautiful uh, mother. Um, and like so many children walking right on the sea ledge on the malecon was something that, that you did back then and that um, kids still do today um, in Cuba. And we'll keep moving forward. I just want to show you some pictures. Um, so I was a little girl in Cuba um, and these pictures, I'm so grateful for them as, as you probably know, most of the Cubans that left the island in the 60s could only take one suitcase and they typically brought um, their photographs, their family photographs with them. The mothers and the grandmothers packed those photographs. And thanks to my mother and my grandmother bringing so many pictures, I have this memory of my childhood um, in Cuba. And we'll go on to the next one. And um, here I am with this doll, and this doll sparked um, a story in Lucky Broken Girl. Ruthie, the main character in the book, has, um, has a doll that, um, that she loves, but her mother throws it away because it's falling apart. The stuffing is coming out. And seeing this picture um, inspired um, that, that bit of writing in the book. So we'll keep going. And this picture is a very important one because it was um, one of the last pictures taken of me in Cuba before we left, and I'm wearing my school uniform. I briefly went to the Centro Israelita, the Israelite um, Center, and, um, and this was my uniform. And in fact, one of the things that came from Cuba that my mother thought to bring, which is amazing, was my school uniform. And I actually have this uniform that you see in the picture. But we'll keep going, um, ar arriving um, in the US with my parents and my little brother. And next slide. And so I wanted to show you where we settled uh, when we came to the United States. We went to live in Queens, New York. This is the first building where we lived um, in the United States. That's my maternal grandfather with a cousin. And, um, and I wanted to show you this so you get a feeling for the setting of the book, um, since it all takes place in, um, in this area, in that building. Here are my mother and my aunt Sylvia. Um, looking very fashionable. And you see the cars also of the 60s. This was the street uh, on which we lived and where I played hopscotch, where Ruthie in the book plays hopscotch. And we'll move on to the next slide. And of course, for Cubans who went to New York, the, um, the experience of seeing snow was huge. You know, um, seeing snow was something that you could never see in Cuba. So it was a big deal for us. Um, the next picture also shows you snow. Um, so that was kind of like, you know, really coming to a new and different place uh, in the United States. Um, and we'll keep going. And here's a picture from a birthday party, um, one of the um, pictures from before the car accident that the book is about. And I wanted you to see it because um, behind me and my mother, my mother looks wonderful there, um, there's, a, there's a lamp. And if you look at that picture of the lamp, the lamp is covered in plastic because um, we had so few possessions, we had just arrived from Cuba, that the lamp was a precious purchase and so it was covered with the plastic so that it wouldn't get dirty. We'll go to the next slide. Um, and this is the bedroom. So you know that Lucky Broken Girl, those of you that have already read it, know that it's about a girl just arrived from Cuba who ends up in a terrible car accident with her family and she has to be in a body cast for close to an entire year. Um, and basically in bed in her room. And so this is to give you a sense of just the small room that I shared with my brother. This is, this is the setting of uh, Lucky Broken Girl. And there's a blackboard there too, because from the time I was very little, I wanted to be a teacher. And that was my birthday gift, a blackboard. So this is the, the girl that I was uh, before the car accident. Um, and, you know, I looked at this picture many times trying to think about whether, you know, that girl is still me, whether that girl is still inside me, is that girl a different person from me? How was I going to get into the head of this girl, into the thinking and the feelings of this girl? And that was kind of my mission in writing Lucky Broken Girl, being back inside um, the, the body of, of this girl. Uh, go next. And um, just wanted to show you this one for those of you that have read the book. Uh, Ruthie has a friend named Danielle 
um, from Belgium, and that is based on truth. Um, she was a very dear friend in real life, Dina, uh, now living in Toronto, and we're still in touch. And this is a picture of the two of us after, um, after I recovered from the car accident. And, um, and my grandmother comes up as an important character in the story, my maternal grandmother, Esther. And so I wanted to show you um, some pictures of her after she arrived in Cuba. And then this was me um, after recovering um, from, from the car accident. And, um, and then one last slide um, that I love. Um, this is uh, some artwork that, um, that a student who studies education uh, made. And, um, and the exercise was to take five words from the book and illustrate them. And so Frida, Playa Vaquita, Incense, Shiva, and Guava, or Guayaba, all come up in the book and I love this idea of taking taking different words and kind of seeing the different cultures that come together um, in the story of Lucky Broken Girl. So I think I'll stop there because I know we have some really wonderful questions coming up from Ana Menendez and from Rebecca Friedman and I'm so excited about that. So thank you for listening to this part. I think it's my turn. I think it's my turn. Thank you so much, Ruth, for that introduction and for, thank you to everyone for being here today. Um, I so enjoyed those pictures. Before I, I start and ask my questions, I just have to say so familiar looking at those pictures as the daughter of Polish Jewish immigrants to New York. That lamp was in my grandmother's house <laughs> with the very same cover, so very familiar. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> but for the first question I wanted to ask you, as somebody who has long admired your academic work, your anthropology, um, anthropological writing um, for a long time, I've always been so intrigued by your notion of the anthropologist as a vulnerable observer. And so I wonder if you would talk for just a minute about the relationship between between your notions as an anthropologist about being an observer and writing about other cultures and then transforming that to being a fiction writer and really writing in part about your own experiences or the ones that you remember so filtered through memory and what that relationship is, if anything. Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. I could probably go on for hours, but I definitely <laughs> won't do that now. <laughs> um, but, you know, when I started in anthropology, I mean, I thought it was just such a fascinating profession to, to meet people of different communities and different cultures and get to know them intimately and to travel. And in my case, I traveled to all these Spanish speaking countries because I always loved everything having to do with Spain and Latin America and the Spanish language and music and so on. So I had that opportunity, but I was taught anthropology in the way they used to teach anthropology back at that time when I was a student in the 70s and 80s, you have to maintain a lot of distance from the people that you were studying. And, you know, and I tried my best to do that because I was supposed to do that as an anthropologist, but it just felt very alienating to me. And um, I just felt I couldn't treat people that way as, as so, so distant from me because I felt so many connections with the people that I was working with. Um, and so that's how I came up on this idea of being the vulnerable observer that I, I was observing vulnerably that I could feel, you know, my heart, you know, cracking or breaking sometimes when I heard certain stories. And then I realized I was making them vulnerable because when people have to tell you the story of their life, they're kind of opening themselves to you. So I thought about how, you know, everybody's a vulnerable observer in that situation. Um, and so, you know, now we talk a lot about vulnerability and how important it is to be vulnerable so that we can have empathy for others and understand the stories of other people and the suffering of other people. And I think I brought that thinking into being a fiction writer um, where Ruthie is this vulnerable observer. She's this girl that has to be in a body cast and she doesn't know how long it's gonna last. She doesn't know if she's ever going to get out of bed, if she's ever going to walk again. So she's very vulnerable, but at the beginning of the story, she's very self-centered. It's like my vulnerability and I'm the one that's in this terrible situation, but where she finally gets kind of a, a larger sense of what vulnerability means is when she realizes that she has to be vulnerable for others as well, and that she's not the only one 
who's vulnerable, others as well. Her mother is suffering because her mother has to take care of her and can't go out as much as she would like to. Her grandmother is a, is a double immigrant and has been through so much. Um, she learns that other people are also vulnerable. And I think that's a big lesson in the story. And maybe that comes out of the anthropology as well. Plus the book is very attuned to to different cultures and, and how they converge, also how they kind of collide with each other um, in New York. I wanna I wanna say that my grandmother also had that lamp in the in her <laughs> 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 and we may have a, 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 a Venn diagram here <laughs> who had the lamp with the plastic. Um, uh, Ruth, you know, I, I, the book was so meaningful to me on so many, many levels. And um, I, you know, I, I read it in one big delicious gulp when it first came out. And then I reread it um, now in preparation for this. And uh, I found so much that resonated with our moment. Uh, you, you've already touched on the, the um, incredible diversity that Ruthie grows up with, which is something that um, I didn't grow up in Miami, I grew up in Tampa, but you know, a lot of Cuban Americans who grew up in Miami, even in Tampa, it was, it was a much more constrained um, uh, you know, group of people that we hung out with. Um, so that resonated. And the other thing that resonated with me, surprisingly, which I hadn't really noticed as much, uh, or maybe felt, talking about being a vulnerable observer, is this sense of constrainment. You know, reading the book in lockdown had a completely different effect. Uh, and I really uh, felt with Ruthie for that physical uh, constraint that she was in. Of course, it's very different from the one we're in, but I did find some resonance and, you know, kind of a, uh, a cozy claustrophobia that we're all in now. And, and then she doesn't want, you know, when she can walk, I hope I'm not giving any spoilers, but, you know, it's not, it's not a, you know, when she can walk, it's not something she's super excited about doing either. Have you heard from people uh, about this who are reading it now? And what kind of, you know, what, what um, message does Ruthie send to us from those <laughs> days of confinement? Thank you. Well, that's a great, great question. I guess I'll start with the first one about the diversity and, um, you know, I, I really, I think of this book also as a kind of love letter to New York or New York in a certain era when I was growing up. And, and you know, we too, I mean, we were, we had our own kind of Cuban cluster of people, you know, and it was called El Grupo, you know, and El Grupo were all Cubanos, almost all of them Jewish Cubans. So they were like a subgroup of the Cubans. Um, and these were all friends of my parents, you know, from Cuba, and they would get together. And of course, the family also resettled, uh, most of the family resettled in New York at first. And so we had this, this cluster of people that we that we hung out with on a regular basis. But being in New York, I was also aware that we were part of this larger mosaic of immigrants and that we weren't the only immigrants, right? That there were Latinos of many different backgrounds, you know, Puerto Ricanos, Dominicanos, etc. Um, and then there were just people from all over, like, you know, my friend was from Belgium, you know, and I had another friend from Finland. I mean, people were like from all over um, in New York. And I think that gave me a sense of my Cubanness that, that I think is a little different from the Cubanness that you might have had growing up in Miami or Tampa, as you did. There's a joke that Richard Blanco, my dear friend, always tells that, um, you know, he, he lives in Maine now most of the time, and of course is also in Miami teaching at FIU. But one of the jokes that he loves to tell is that he went to Maine for the diversity. <laughs> <laughs> because in you know I was Cuba I was about to say in Miami you know he mainly grew up with other other Cubans you know growing up in Wichita you know he was mainly surrounded by other other Cuban kids and went to a school where mostly everybody was Cuban and I didn't have that you know in New York yeah I mean we had the the children of my parents friends and the family but it wasn't this whole community um, but in the 70s half of my family um, decided to move to Miami they got tired of the snow and they, uh, you know, they moved to Miami. So, so we would always visit Miami once a year. Of course, we would go in July or August when it was really hot, you know, not, not when the Americanos go, you know, we would go like in the summer. And um, so I always had a sense of, of this, you know, the, this other way to be Cuban, the Miami sense of how to be Cuban, and then kind of the New York sort of way to be Cuban, which was, you know, in connection with all these other um, immigrant communities. Um, so there's that. And then in regard to your other question about sort of Ruthie and the, and the pandemic, um, yeah, I like that term, cozy claustrophobia, I think. That <laughs> 
<laughs> that's a great one for I think how a lot of us are, are feeling um, right now or trying to make it cozy so that we can survive through this time. And yeah, and Ruthie, you know, definitely is a girl who's forced to be in bed, who's forced to be immobile, um, which is a very difficult thing because, you know, she's an immigrant kid, you know, and she and her family are used to moving and being able to restart in a new place. But here she is a girl who, who can't move um, and who has to be attended to by her mother. And all of that is really, really difficult and at first very painful and she's so miserable at first. And I was trying to remember the experience, you know, 50 years later, like, what was that like? Trying to, you know, imagine having to be in bed for such a long time and uh, have a pole between my legs that my mother would use to turn me on my stomach so that I wouldn't be on my back all the time and just trying to imagine like, how did I survive that? You know, I don't even know how I managed to do that. And that was part of the fun of writing the book is like, how does, how does somebody go through an experience like this and, and make it and not go crazy? Um, and so, um, so it was a lot of fun to sort of imagine, you know, both all the terrible things about it, but also some of the good things that came out of it as well. And that's why she's a lucky broken girl because there are some lucky things that happen. Um, just like now we're going through this terrible pandemic, but there are some you know, deep things that are happening to all of us during this time, deep spiritual kinds of things. And, um, and I think that's, that's what happened with Ruthie. And I think that's maybe something, as you asked, you know, what can we take away from this story? What lessons does Ruthie offer? Well, in the end, she has to make the best of it. And so she becomes a girl who reads books. You know, she was a hopscotch queen, but she can't play hopscotch anymore. So, okay, we've got to leave that, that story behind and become another Ruthie. And so this other Ruthie is reading books and becoming a thinker and listening to stories and, you know, listening to her grandmother's story. And so the, the possibility of, of becoming another person through, you know, through a situation like that. Um. You kind of began to talk about this a little bit, but what was it like, or what is it like to tr to write in the voice of a young girl? I mean, a girl who is in part yourself and in part imagination, in part memory. Um, very as somebody who's been writing her whole life, what is it like to all of a sudden try and imagine that perspective? Well, thanks for the question. I mean, it has been very liberating, actually. You know, I've tried all my life to write like a good academic, <laughs> you know, to write really, you know, deep intellectual stuff. And I, I think I haven't done that well. <laughs> you know? I mean, you asked me about the vulnerable observer. I mean, I, I found that though when I was doing my academic work, I kept wanting to bring in the, the personal and and the emotions and the heart. And, you know, I, I, I couldn't seem to just do like intellectual work on its own. And I struggled with that, I think, my whole, my whole career. And Lucky Broken Girl began with me just trying to channel this girl, like the girl that I showed in the photographs. Like, that was me, but, but can I be that girl again so many decades later? You know, so I felt like I was channeling her and like listening to her and it was her, it was me and it was not me. And, um, and at first, I didn't know what I was doing. I was just writing in a young girl's voice. And I didn't even know what kind of book it was going to be. It was just Ruthie talking, like Ruthie telling her story in a way, the way I had done my work as an anthropologist, where I would listen to people's stories and write them down and try to figure out what they meant. And it was sort of like, you know, I was listening to Ruthie, like, okay, this is the story she wants to tell me. And I was writing it down. Um, and um, and it was very liberating. It was like, oh, wow, this is a girl's voice. It's not an adult woman's voice. It's a girl's voice and talking as a girl. And I don't know, I just, I really loved it. I, I didn't know until the end exactly what kind of book it was. And then when I finished, I said, I think this is a book for kids because I'm, you know, I'm writing from the girl's voice. But at the same time, I was hoping it could be a, kind of a, a book for everybody, like a book that a child could read. And so many kids have read the book, you know, eight and nine year old kids even have read the book. And it's so amazing. And um, so, you know, and, and Anna had asked too about if I've heard from kids and I have um, kids who are reading the book 
you know, have been reading the book now during the pandemic. So kids read it. But then I also get messages from adults who've read it and say, oh, this is really meaningful to me. And so that was a little bit of a dream that it would be a book that, you know, that a young person could read on their own or could read it with, you know, with a mother or father or, you know, or whatever, with a grandmother. Um, and, <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, it was just, um, it was a really beautiful experience. And, and, it, and it led me through um, a whole emotional spectrum I feel because I think kids, kids feel so much, you know, um, because th they're both so savvy and smart about everything that's going on, but they still have that innocence, you know, kids who are 10 and 11 and so on. And, um, and so I wrote with great respect, you know, thinking about, you know, being a kid and, um, and just how, you know, how deep children are. Um, and, and to have been able to write a book that a 10 year old can read and enjoy to me has been one of the highlights of my writing <laughs> career. I mean, it's just, it's, it's been amazing. I, I feel very, very, very happy about that. It is a beautiful book that I, 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 for me, it was a book that really does transcend, uh, age, uh, and culture, uh, also, um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about your decision to, to write this as fiction instead of as memoir. And once you made that choice, uh, what did you discover? I mean, I think we often talk about the ethical responsibilities of turning a life story into fiction, but I'm also interested in the aesthetic responsibilities um, that writers have. And so in writing it, did you discover a particular elements that fiction required uh, as opposed to those that were required by your scholarly and academic work? Yes, no, absolutely. Um, as I mentioned, I mean, I've written books based on people's life stories. I wrote a book about a Mexican street peddler named Translated Woman. And with that book, you know, there were moments when it might have been better to move the story around in certain ways or to just change it. I mean, there was so much I could have done to sort of make it a better narrative, um, but I didn't dare do it because it was it was anthropology and I had heard the story in a certain way, in a certain order, and I had to be true to that, you know, and I, and I had also taped recorded, I had tape recorded the story and then I had transcribed it and then I had translated it into English. And so I, I felt I had to be as true as possible to, to the narrative as I heard it from Esperanza, the woman um, who is the subject of that book. And so with fiction, um, what I found is that I still needed to be true to that time to 1966 when the story takes place. So it couldn't be anachronistic. I had to think about what was going on in the 60s, what that time was like. So, I mean, it has a lot of truth and there are a lot of the characters are based on real people, on my family and neighbors and friends. So I wanted to be as true as possible to, to how they were. But on the other hand, I didn't tape record my childhood, you know, so I don't, you know, I don't have the exact, you know, dialogue, you know, I don't, I don't remember exactly what my mother said or what my father said at certain points. I don't remember what I said. So as a fiction writer, I had to invent the dialogue. I had to write the dialogue, imagine what they could have said, what they might have said, what they probably would have said. Um, and that was exciting and very frightening for me too, that, oh my God, I can have them say anything, you know, <laughs> and I, I hadn't had that experience before um, as an anthropologist, but as a fiction writer, I could do that. I could, you know, I could have them, you know, speak in any way that I wanted. Um, and so that was pretty amazing. But I think what I enjoyed the most was that I was able to be a little bit more magical than real life. And that was something that I think it's a, it's a gift that fiction writers have to bring in that sort of magical view of things so that towards the end of the story, Ruthie now has one cast on her leg, but she still can't get out of bed. She still can't walk. And the two um, hospital attendants come and bring a stretcher on the first day of the year on January 1st, and they bring her outside so she can help make a snowman. And it's just such a beautiful moment, again, like, you know, Cubans and snow and, you know, how magical that is. And, uh, and she's helping to make the snowmen and these two hospital attendants have just come just, just to make her happy. And it's a moment that I love in the story. And when my mother read it, she said, oh, yeah, I remember that. That was so beautiful. And then I said to her, well, actually, that never happened. 
<laughs> I said, I made that up, you know, that never happened, but, but I wish it could have happened because it would have been so beautiful. And so, so that's what I got to do with fiction that I could add like those moments of magic that could have happened, you know, and they would have been beautiful. So, so that's where you get to, to embellish, you know, and, and to shape. And, um, and I think that's, that's part of the fun. Well, you're a fiction writer. I mean, that's part of the fun of being a fiction writer, but I think it also gives you a different kind of responsibility as to how you, you know, how you create the magic and, you know, where is it going to make sense to do that? Um, so you have a different kind of responsibility, I think, as a fiction writer, but, um, but it's, it's, a, it's been a fun experience for me after a long career writing nonfiction to now be able to, to do things like that. I absolutely love that story that the fact that your mother believed it to be true. I mean, it says so much about, about memory, right? And the way that each of us remembers our childhoods and our past, what's true, what's not true, what does it matter in a way. Um, I'm wondering if you actually interviewed anybody for this book in your family or if, was it really truly based on your memories? Did you, did you have particular kind of directed conversations with anybody while you were writing this? I, I asked some questions to my mother and some to my brother also, but, um, but I didn't formally interview them at all. Um, I think I really wanted to trust my memory and my experience and, and the story that I wanted to tell. Um, so I think I was a little afraid even, you know, before the book came out when I had the first proofs of the book. I was a little afraid to share it um, with my family. I thought, well, what did they say? No, it didn't happen like that. Uh, and then I'll go, oh, then I won't trust my vision. I thought, no, you know, I'm going to trust my vision. It is fiction. Um, and, you know, it's the way I want to imagine what happened, the way I remember it. So, so yeah, I didn't, I didn't do a lot of that, um, you know, kind of research work. I, you know, I asked some questions, definitely. I checked in about a couple of things with my brother to see if he remembered them the same way, and he did. Um, so things like that, but I didn't, you know, I didn't like do like, which I could have done, like a full interview. It would have been interesting to have interviewed. I mean, there's so many people in my family that remember that time in my life, um, you know, my, my aunt and uncle, aunt and aunts and uncles and cousins, and a lot of people, you know, witnessed what happened and remember me at that, at that time in bed. And I could have talked to all of them and, and, you know, written a different kind of story, but, um, but no, somehow with this one, it was, it was very much me and Ruthie. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We have time for more que for another question from me, or if we want to open it up to the audience. But I have it's a it's a very Cuban question because I when I was reading, uh, you know, about the go-go boots, um, and, and you know when when her friend gives her her go-go boots at the end, which is such a meaningful gesture. And of course, uh, as a Cuban, I couldn't help but think of Los Zapaticos de Rosa. Uh -huh. And uh, it, it was, you know, such, you know, for me, that had so many layers. Did it have it for you as we're writing it consciously? Or is it something that just, you know, that or, or did it actually happen that way? I don't know that she actually gave you the go-go boots. But that act of giving somebody shoes to me is so uh, intertwined with uh, Los Zapaticos de Rosa. <laughs> I, I love that. I don't think I truly had that in mind when I was writing it, but but from now on, I will say I, I did, because <laughs> I like that. Um, <laughs> um, no, so, um, you know, I don't even know if I should admit this. That that didn't actually happen, but, um, but I thought it could have happened. <laughs> Beautiful scene. It's a beautiful scene. And, um, and so that's another kind of magical moment where I thought, you know, um, how is Ruthie going to stop limping? Because I was very torn about how to end the story because in real life, the limp took a long time to go away. And so the limp took about a year to go away after I started walking. And I remember my family being desperate. When is she going to stop limping? I had a very bad, very, very bad limp. And so I remembered that in the exasperation, you know, my exasperation, everybody else's exasperation. But I thought, I, I can't end it. I was going to end it with Ruthie still limping. And I thought, that's not going to be a satisfactory ending. Um, and, and somehow it came to me that because Ruthie had so loved Danielle's boots, that it would make so much sense for Danielle to have saved them for Ruthie. So it just kind of had this poetic logic 
to it. And I don't, you know, you know how it is when you write, like you, you struggle so much to write something. Then when you write it and it's done, you don't even know how you wrote it. You know, it's just, it just kind of happened. And, and I think that's what happened with that scene and the interchange of the boots, you know, that Ruthie's not going to get the black ones and Dina gets the white boots. And I don't know, it just felt right. Um, and, and it felt magical. And that, that was definitely one of those moments where I was writing the magic into reality and, and really enjoying that. But from now on, I will say, that I was definitely thinking about Los Zapatigos de Rosa. <laughs> there's so many wonderful magical moments because there's the piñatas also. Yeah. Uh, and that, you know, you can just see that room full of piñatas. It's just, uh, there were very moments of, of magic that were not magical realism. They're just magic of a childhood. And it's just beautifully done. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So I don't know, do we have time for questions? Um, what do you two, how, how do we do this? Do you two want to look at the questions on the, in the chat? Um, Someone's request, Ju Judith is asking me to speak about the mother-daughter relationship. Should I do that? Sure, actually, yeah, I would be very curious to hear about that. Let's, that let's start with that. And yeah, then I'll, I'll read them as you answer. Yeah, um, there's the scene with the lame uh, sandal with one gold lame sandal on my left foot and one gold lame sandal on mommy's <laughs> right foot. We're a complete person. Could you please speak to the mother daughter relationship and how it changes throughout the uh, novel? Yeah, no, absolutely. That's a very, very important part of the story. I'd probably say it's one of the most, um, you know, important aspects of the story is the mother daughter relationship. And, and it's something that I thought about a lot. Um, you know, obviously, when I went through the experience, I was a daughter and not yet a mother. And then many years later, I became a mother myself. And I was trying to imagine it both from the mother and the daughter perspective as I wrote. And I think at the time when I was a child, I didn't totally understand, you know, how difficult this was for my mother. I think when you're a child, you just expect your your mother to be there to care for you, and you don't you don't question that. Uh, most of the time, if we're lucky, if we have good mothers, um, as I did, and so I think looking at it now in retrospect, so many years later, realizing that this must have been very very hard for my mother, and actually my son. Gabriel had a leg injury also when he was growing up, when he was about 12, um, he had an ACL injury and needed surgery. And it was so hard on me as a mother, it was so painful to see what he went through that I think some of that experience I was able to bring into Lucky Broken Girl and think about this beautiful Cuban woman, you know, who's just arrived in New York, you know, she's like 30 years old. She's still very young. She has two children. She's starting over. She doesn't know English. Everything is scary and difficult. And on top of it, she's got a girl to take care of, you know, in bed. How difficult that must have been. So I wanted to bring some empathy to the mother um, in the story, but at the same time show the girl's expectation of like, you have to take care of me. Um, but the girl also at times, Ruthie at times fearing what would happen to her if her mother wasn't there, you know, and um, that comes up a few times in the story as well. And I feel that by the end of the story, they've, they've reconciled um, the tensions in their relationship and the, the mom is, is so happy that Ruthie's finally you know, able to, to, to be a, a person who can, who can walk and who can be independent again. Thank you. We, ha we do have a number of um, questions, so I think I'll just go ahead and ask them. Um, one of our listeners asks you if it was painful to relive the accident as you were writing the book. Yes, it was, there were moments that were very, very painful for sure, for sure. Um, you know, there were things that I remembered. I think when you write, um, you relive things too. That's why, you know, writing is such a powerful experience. And, you know, and I remembered things like the leg actually being in pain, um, you know, while I was in the cast, you know, because it's a bone that's trying to re-knit and to heal. And I remember that it was, it was painful. And that, um, 
and that sometimes I would be afraid in the middle of the night and, but I didn't want to call anybody because everybody was already taking care of me. And I, I, you know, those nights that, that were so scary. And there's that um, scene in the book where Ruthie asks her father for a flashlight and she's got the flashlight and she puts the sheet over her head. And it's like, you know, there's this like light, you know, that, that's kind of trying to, to guide her a little bit during this time of darkness, but she doesn't want to bother anybody because she's already bothering everybody by being in bed. So lots of memories like that came back to me that I had literally just put away, you know, all of these years. Um, so remembering that and just remembering things like how smelly it felt to be in a cast for so long. And that's why there's like that moment where the mother comes in, I get best, you know, <laughs> she comes in. It's like, this is so, you're so smelly. And, you know, cause of course it wasn't possible to take a shower. You know, you, you could sort of wash up with a wash basin and a cloth, but you know, I, I wasn't showering. And, and so we, all those things came back and it was both funny and, you know, and, and painful at times. Um, and remembering some of the moments too, that were happy you know, the family kind of coming around the bed at times for birthday parties and, and things like that. So sort of remembering that, that mix of emotions, but definitely there were a lot of painful moments that, that came back to me as I wrote. Yeah. I can imagine. Um, another question that is asked, which is one that I thought of as well, is whether or not your family has read the book um, and what some of their responses were and if it brought up memories for them. And related to that, another um, listener asked whether or not you've read this to your grandchildren. So I presume you have grandchildren. These people seem to know you. So. <laughs> I was not going to ask that question, but I just did. So. <laughs> I well, I don't have grandchildren yet. But oh, okay. <laughs> but, but, but I hope to. <laughs> Okay, so maybe the first part of the question we will ask. So in the midst, I got, I, that got so emotional. What was the first part of the question? <laughs> Sorry. Um, the first part of the question, or the first question was whether or not your family had read the memoir. Oh, yes, whether the family has read the book. I'm sorry, I just like, went, went into grand, grandmother <laughs> mode. Well, I definitely want to be called abuelita when I become a grandmother. That, that much I know. Um, <laughs> But um, yes, the family has read the book, um, you know, my, gave it to my parents right away to read and they read it. And one of the funny things they said is, this is like the first book that, of mine that they actually understand. <laughs> so, so they have read it and, um, and they, they have read it aloud to each other um, as well. And my brother has read it and aunts and uncles and cousins, um, you know, my husband and son read it in manuscript. I guess they, they were they were among my early readers, um, I would say. And uh, yeah, I would say, you know, the whole family or most of the family um, has read the book by now. And, um, and I think hopefully it's a book that doesn't upset anybody um, <laughs> in the family. Um, because as, as we all know, when you write about your family, um, it's usually very hard to please everybody. Um, but um, but hopefully this book, I think with, with its magical touches, um, helps to, helps to create an atmosphere that is, that is more, more open, um, to, to all kinds of readers, including my family. <laughs> been translated into Spanish, Ruth? It's about to be, it hasn't been yet. Um, and I, I feel like I'm going to knock on wood cause I'm superstitious, but we're actually just working out plans to translate Lucky Broken Girl and the next book coming in August, Letters from Cuba. So hopefully both of those will, will be uh, out, out in Spanish soon. Wonderful. Um, so we have another question um, which asks you to speak about your fiction, creative writing process um, and your revision process versus your academic writing and revision process. That's a great question. Um, well, in both kinds of writing, revision is very important. And I mean, whoever has asked this question obviously is a writer because um, when you write, you must revise. And I think a lot of people who don't write think it's just a matter of just throwing things on the page and it's done. And those of us that write know that revision is very important that, you know, sometimes you write, I mean, I have a lot of things that I write that get cut out. Um, and so that, that's always part of the revision process. Sometimes you write too much or you write more than you need for the story. So, so part of my process sometimes is overwriting, writing more, more scenes, more dialogue, um, a lot more things than I'm going to really need 
but sometimes I need to do that to understand the characters, understand more of their, you know, what they're going through, what their lives are like. So kind of overwriting and then sculpting. I think of writing um, as being a, a process of sculpting where you have a, a lot of wood, say, and then you have to, you know, keep sculpting till you can really see what the story is. And I think that happens to me a lot. Um, but I'm actually really happy when I have a lot of writing finally done and I can sculpt. That's the happy part of writing for me. The hardest part is when I'm starting and I'm on page 30 and I have no idea how I will ever get to page 100. That is the hardest part. It's like, wait, what, what else is going to happen? What, what, what's, what's, this, what's this going to, to do? Where is this going to go? And that part of writing is very scary. Um, so, so I write, usually I have a vague sense of where the story is going. With fiction, I need to know who my main characters are and kind of what, what are some of the conflicts or problems that they're dealing with. I need to kind of start from there. I often need to know the setting, like is it taking place in New York or Michigan or Cuba? Setting is very important to me and that's where I think it connects to my anthropology where setting is so important and you know I've spent time in Spain and Mexico and Cuba and that sense of place is always very important to me so when I write I have to really know where where the story is taking place um, that's very true for my fiction and uh, my anthropology and I think with with the anthropology um, and you know and you talked about sort of checking in with family for this book and I think with anthropology you check in with the people that you're writing about and you know I've done this always um, you know, I'll check in like, this is what I'm going to be saying about you. This is what I plan to publish. Is this going to be all right with you? And, you know, I did that kind of check in with Esperanza Hernandez for Translated Woman. But with fiction, you don't have to, um, if you don't want to, because it's fiction and, you know, you're, you're giving yourself, you're being granted permission to tell the story that you want to tell. So there, I would say it's more optional, but, um, but I might check in even with fiction about certain things, um, especially because so much of what I do is historical fiction. So I want to check in. The, the new novel, Letters from Cuba, takes place in 1938. So I checked in with a lot of historians to find out, like, does this make sense? Is this what Cuba was like in 1938? So I checked in with like five historians to, you know, to get some you know, some, some sense of clarity. So, so I think those check-ins for, for accuracy um, are important too. Um, and that, that happens while you're writing as you're trying to figure out, you know, does this make sense? What, you know, what I'm saying, is this something that, you know, that has legitimacy, even, even when you're writing fiction? Okay. Thank you. So I'm gonna just quickly take this opportunity to ask a question that is my question. Um, which is, I know you, you've said, and it is a book for young people, which frankly, I didn't know when I read it. I didn't know that until you said it the other day. I didn't notice. I mean, I so enjoyed the, the, the story on its own terms. I wasn't even considering audience. I'm wondering, I know you've, you have um, spoken with younger audiences right, about this book. I'm wondering what kinds of questions they have and how those are different or if they're different than the conversation we're having now. So in other words, how, in what ways does it resonate with the young folks who read your, who read your book? Thank you. Well, in, in many interesting ways, you know, kids are very interested. The questions that you two have been asking too about the relationship between fiction and reality or fiction and truth. So they often want to know, because they know it's based on my life, they want to know, well, how much of it really happened? Did that happen? Did this happen? <laughs> you know, um, and so they often um, will go, you know, literally page by page or chapter by chapter and ask me questions about, did that happen? You know, um, there's um, a, a character from India, you know, Ramu, who is uh, one of Ruthie's friends, and he gives her a necklace. And so a question that I often get from kids is, do you still have that necklace? you know, things like that. And, um, and it's so sweet. Um, so, so they'll ask me questions about, you know, about the reality of the book. They want to know how much really happened, how much did I make up? And so, so then it gets us into this interesting conversation again about fiction and, you know, how, how fiction is different from writing a memoir, um, which was, I think, a question that one of you asked me before that I, I could have written a memoir, um, but I didn't because I wasn't sure that I remembered everything that had happened totally accurately. And I wanted to give myself permission 
to fictionalize certain things. And so that's why I went to, to fiction. I could have perhaps gone to memoir because memoir also reconstructs, you know, memory and, and things that happened. And I might have done that. I might have maybe used, you know, more, you know, historical materials or something like that. Um, but, you know, but I didn't do that. I, I wanted, I wanted to give myself permission um, to write fiction. So that's usually where the conversations with the kids lead me. Um, and they often want to know about the emotion also of writing the book, which were questions that you two asked. Like they'll say to me, were you crying when you wrote the book? Or, you know, things like that. And I'll say, yeah, at certain moments I was crying, you know. Um, and so I, I love those kinds of questions that kids, you know, think about writing as an emotional process. Um, they ask me sometimes, like, did you feel better? after you wrote the book did you know like sort of like did the book heal you like writing did it heal you and 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 i say yes you know i think that was you know definitely one of the blessings of writing this book that i had kind of carried the story and i think one of the things that also led me to write it is that i had kind of felt that i had been a bit of a bother um to the family that you know this had happened and they had to take care of me and they had to worry about me and um and so in a sense i hadn't fully allowed myself to to be the broken girl you know that i felt sort of you know pressure to heal you know they were, they were getting tired of of dealing with this girl in bed. <laughs> and and i think you know writing it kind of allowed me to like okay let me let me give some sympathy to this girl that i was this girl and um and to give myself compassion self compassion that we sort of talk about these days um that that was important too and i think that the kids questions have led me to realize that you know that that was definitely an important motivation in doing this too is kind of like going ahead and and giving myself the compassion that, that perhaps I didn't give myself at the time, you know, where I was like trying to be as brave as possible and trying to put on a good face to what had happened. Um, so I think that that was liberating. I often, uh, back to this idea of the writer being a sculptor, I tell, I tell students, uh, writing students, that uh, being a writer is like being a sculptor, except you make your own stone. So that's the, that's the revision process. I love that. <laughs> yeah. I love there's, that. There's a question there about, um, you know, what, um, it, it, what parts of the book resonated with uh, Rebecca or, or with me. And I'll just speak very briefly to it that even now in memory, the, the thing that stands out to me uh, so much is the family dynamics. Uh, the fact that all the family is there. Uh, that the cousins are coming over, that they play with the cousins, and this very strong dad with opinions and, um, you know, a, a kind of uh, authority in, in the house. That, to me, was, you know, very, um, very uh, resonated with me. Uh, Thank you. Know about Rebecca. Yeah, I mean, many aspects, but the one that stands out at this moment is actually the very beginning of the book. Um, I think before, it must be before the accident, where, where she is, uh, is it in school? It's the descriptions of school and the kind of feeling of being an immigrant and being str the strangeness vis-a-vis -vis mainstream culture resonated for me very much. I myself am not an immigrant, but my, my mother is. <clears throat> and it's, it's, it resonated very much with stories that she herself would tell about herself in kind of public school and then experience. So that's what's sticking out for me now is the kind of immigrant piece that I very much grew up with. Yeah, well, thank you. I mean, those are great because I think, you know, Anna, you probably see a very Cuban family <laughs> you know, depicted in the story. And then Rebecca, yeah, the, the immigrant girl. And I mean, and those memories are so vivid for me, what, you know, mm -hmm. what that was like to, you know, to go to a school where you, you know, you were the foreigner. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that was so difficult. And, and of course, everything that I talk about at the beginning of the book, you know, being viewed as, as dumb, because you don't uh, don't speak English, you know that was that was a really horrible experience, which hopefully kids didn't go through as much. The immigrant kids who landed in Cuba, I mean in Cuba and Miami, hopefully didn't didn't go through such a terrible process of um, of uh, adaptation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank Thanks you. So much. Thank you so much, um, uh, Anna, Rebecca, and, and Ruth. Uh, unfortunately, we have run out of time today, and we must say goodbye or hasta la próxima. Uh, but I really would love to thank you 
for your generous time uh, and this truly heartwarming conversation. Um, I also would like to thank our friends at the Jewish Museum of Florida and the Casa Cuba team for their hard work behind the scenes to coordinate this event, particularly my colleague Maite Morales. Um, and thank you, um, the wider audience, for tuning in and for your thoughtful questions. Uh, make sure to visit our pages and follow us on social media to stay up to date and to receive details about our next event featuring Ruth Behar on July 23rd. In this next Conversando, Ruth will give us an exciting and exclusive preview of her new book, Letters from Cuba. Uh, I wish you and your families the very best during these challenging times and I sincerely hope that you enjoyed this event and that you will consider joining our historic efforts to build our Casa Cuba. Muchas gracias. Adios. Thank you.